All right. Well, let's go ahead and get into uh, our keynote speaker. I'm very happy to introduce our uh, keynote to kick this event, our 20th anniversary event off, uh, Mr. Steve Brown. Steve Brown is a writer, a lecturer, motivational speaker, fellow Toastmasters uh, graduate, I, I just found out, and uh, also a, uh, a former uh, professional in the gaming industry, and I believe he also continues to do consulting work. But Steve uh, has written a book called How to Raise a Rocket Scientist for Fun and Profit, and it's his first novel. He holds a Bachelor of Administration degree in English and Creative Writing from the University of Colorado. Has a wife, Robin, and two children, Katie Mae and Chris, including a daughter who was born with cerebral palsy. And uh, he has an amazing story. So please uh, join me in welcoming our featured keynote speaker for this session, Mr. Steve Brown. Boy, that was easy. Where were you guys when I was selling cars? <laughs> I don't know if this is working. Can you hear me? I don't know if you turned number one on. Did you turn number one on? Number one. Number one. There we go. Good morning, Florida. Well, that sucked. Did they drop me off in New York? Is this New York? Or is this Florida? Yes. Well, then prove it. Good morning, Florida. Yes. How y'all doing? Yes. Well, I'm glad to hear it. Wow, 20 years. Give it up again for the Family Cafe and the crew. 20 years. I want you to give it up for my help, too. I got some help today. On the uh, uh, teleprompter, we got Speedy over there. And Speedy, give her a hand. Speedy has a problem. She's the second fastest typer in the world. 268 words per minute? Yeah. But she has a problem because I talk at 350 words a minute. Good luck. Good luck to you. Good luck. Give it up for my hand signals, too. All right. Uh, superhero is the theme. Superhero of the week. Now that's cool because we all love superheroes. Who's your favorite superhero? Wonder Woman? Flash? Iron Man? Who? Spider Man here. Who's Spider Man? Raise your hand for Spider Man. Raise your hand for Iron Man. Superman. Raise your hand for Batman. Raise your hand for Wonder Woman. There we go. All right, now raise your hand if you're not going to raise your hand no matter what the hell I ask. I got a couple. I got a couple. All right. All right. Well, I thought since it was Superhero Week that it might be a good idea to talk about heroes. As a matter of fact, um, I want to tell you a story about one of my heroes, and I don't have too many heroes. It seems like any more of these days you put people up on a pedestal and somehow they let you down. Actually, heroes is kind of a confusing concept. I mean, it's the kind of deal where it's kind of hard to define. You know one when you see one, but we don't always see them. They're unsung, they're unseen, but they're nevertheless there. And I wanted to get more of a, a, a feel, more of a focus on what a hero is supposed to be. So I did what I always do when I want focus. Now for you millennial, I, I know how to Google. I learned how to Google. Thank you. I prefer to Webster. So I Webstered the definition of hero. Now for you millennials in the room, the Webster Dictionary is what we call a book. It's about that big. Yes, it's bigger than a laptop. It's got a lot of words in it. I'm sure you've seen it. So I looked up the definition of hero. I wanted focus. 
I wanted clarity. I wanted to know what I was talking about. And uh, can we go to the PowerPoint, Richard? There we go. So uh, I looked it up. And a hero, it's a noun. The number one definition, a person who is admired or idealized for courage, outstanding achievements, or noble qualities, such as a war hero. And I thought, well, now I'm getting some focus. But then I got confused again because the number two definition is, of course, another term for a submarine sandwich. <laughs> I thought, well, I don't want to talk about submarine sandwiches today. But then I got to thinking, you know, a friend of mine, his name is Scott. Scott and I have known each other a long time. Our sons grew up. They went through the soccer wars together as kids for years and years and years. And Scott called me up one day several months ago, not too long ago, but, but several months ago, wanted me to come down to my bar. He wanted to buy me a drink. Now, I own a little bar in Carson City, Nevada, where I live. It's kind of a labor of love. It's a side business I've had for 20 years. And I love it when somebody wants to buy me a drink at my bar. That's always a good thing. It's like someone wants to pay you $100 to make a macaroni and cheese at your house. It's a nice deal. So I said, sure, Scott, uh, let's go down to the bar. He wanted to tell me a story about something that had happened to him and his wife, Ruth, not long ago. As a matter of fact, only about a week, week and a half before he was talking to me. So we got down to the bar, and we got comfortable. We got our drinks, and he, he, he told me about a trip they made to Las Vegas. Now, Las Vegas is a good eight-hour drive from where we live up in northern Nevada. But they flew down for a whole weekend because they wanted to attend an outdoor music festival an outdoor country and western music festival that was lasting all weekend. Perhaps some of you heard about it. Where a crazed gunman up in the tower shot, injured 250 some odd people and killed 58. And Scott said when the bullets started bouncing off of the asphalt and he grabbed his wife Ruth and they started to run as fast as they could to the back of the venue. And he said as they ran, he'd never been so scared in all his life, and he'd been in the military. And it seemed that the bullets were following them. And they were, because the gunman was following the people as they ran with his rifle. And they got to the back of the venue, and by then Scott had been able to tell that, that the bullets were coming from up, somewhere up high, from not in the venue. And he saw one of those aluminum bleachers, you know the aluminum bleachers they put up at temporary events? And he grabbed Ruth and they dove under the bleachers. He said he could still hear the sound every night when he went to bed of the bullets pinging off the aluminum as they dove under the bleachers for cover. And he covered up his wife. And at that moment, the bullets stopped as they would stop and start several times during the event while the gunman reloaded or changed rifles. And at that moment, a young couple, about mid-20s, dove in under the bleachers. And they looked terrified. And Scott turned to the young man and he said, son, you've picked a safe place. You'll be safe here. Cover her up. Stay here. You'll be safe. And the young man looked at Scott and he said, no, sir, I have to go. And Scott said, son, I'm older than you. I'm wiser. Trust me. You'll be safe here. Stay here. And the young man once again said to Scott, no, sir, I have to go. And the young man's wife looked at Scott and she said, sir, he's a fireman in LA County and he has to go. And the young man looked back at Scott. He said, will you watch after my wife? And Scott said, I will guard her with my life. And he said, thank you. The bullets started up again. The young man kissed his wife, and with a terrified look on his face, he crawled out from under the bleachers, and he started to run as fast as he could, not away from the bullets, but towards them. Now, I think we can all agree that that young man was a hero. I say was, I mean is, because there is a happy story, at least to this ending. He survived. He made it. They caught up with him a couple of hours later, he didn't have a belt that had been used for a tourniquet. 
He didn't have a shirt. That had been ripped up for bandages. And his feet were all cut up and bloody. He didn't have shoes because they had used those to transport a victim to the ambulance. But he made it. He survived. That young man is a hero. You know it, and I know it. And all because of one reason. For outstanding achievements or noble qualities, for putting an idea, a belief, a purpose ahead of your very existence, ahead of your very own life. And that got me to thinking about heroes and who they are in our life. There are a lot of heroes we never see. I believe that there are a lot of heroes in this room right here. I'd like to tell you a story about my favorite hero. My hero is my daughter. My daughter was born 30 years ago, day after Valentine's Day, 1988, and she was born dead. Her APGAR scores were one, 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 one. And the only reason they weren't zero is because there is no zero for an APGAR score. There's only ones. Her mother almost died. She had to be revived. And she went through 24 hours of intense pain from the nitrogen buildup in her muscles as she screamed and they could give her nothing for the pain. But that's kind of this is not what I came to talk about, so let's move on. Uh, this is my favorite picture ever. That, that's a lot better, isn't it? There she is. Now, I know that was taken a long time ago. Yes, I had less of this and more of that. So go easy on me, okay? I was much younger then. And that's one of my favorite pictures of my hero. No, she couldn't walk. She couldn't roll over. She couldn't really grab anything. She couldn't do much of anything, but she loved to walk around on my shoulders and grab my ears, which are still about two inches shorter than they should be now. She was diagnosed with athetoid cerebral palsy. And when we picked her up from the hospital, we faced something that I think probably many people in this room have faced and still face today. And that is the biggest thing that gnaws at us. And what is that? It is the unknown. It is what we don't know. It is what we are not sure of. It is that big hole inside of us somewhere that we can't fill because we don't know. We asked the doctors, will she be able to walk? They said, we don't know. Will she be able to talk? We don't know. Will she be able to ride a bike, play the piano, be a ballerina? Probably not, but we don't know. I said, you don't know much of anything, do you? He said, no, young man. But I know this. He said these words, and I've never forgotten them. He said, you've been given a gift. And just like the alcoholic who every morning they wake up say, here is another day I have an opportunity not to drink. Every day you wake up, you have an opportunity. You have an opportunity to experience life with your gift, one day at a time. I suggest you do it. I've never forgotten those words. So we took her home and we started on our journey one day at a time. And for a long time when other kids were learning to crawl and then walk and then talk, our little daughter couldn't crawl and she couldn't walk and she couldn't talk. Finally she got old enough that we could actually put helmet on her and pads on her and put her in a steel cage and see if she could learn how to stand up or walk a little bit. Matter of fact, there's the good pictures, the holiday pictures without the helmet and without the pads. She got to know that walker very, very, very well, as some of you have, very well. But she continued on and every day we found new ways to celebrate this gift we were given taking her to the things that she feared, like the water, and just sometimes being able to stand up alone. She fell a lot. She was black and blue, she had broken bones, but she kept at it, she kept drawing. And every day, she would wake up in the morning and she would drag that little body of hers through a full day, and she would never complain. And she always had one thing, the one thing that we could hang our hat on, the one thing 
that brought us more joy than anything else. And that was her smile. It lit up a room. It lit up the whole sky. It lit up the universe. I began to realize that everyone, regardless of who they are, has one thing. What is it? One thing that you can celebrate and enjoy. For her, it was that smile. It never left her face. Well, until she became a teenager. That's another story. That doesn't change, my friends. That doesn't change. So we continued on, teaching her how to walk, teaching her how to stand, always behind, always wondering what would she be able to do and not. And as she grew up, her favorite place in the world, where do you think it was? Not Disney World, we live on the West Coast, folks. Disneyland. You can keep your Disney World. We have Disneyland. Doesn't matter, Disney World, Disneyland. What do they sell at Disney? Who can tell me? They sell what? It's not memories. The product creates the memories. It's not dreams. It's not happiness. Happiest place on earth, my butt. You ever been there in the summer? It's like standing in line at the DMV on the surface of the sun. But they sell one thing. What is it? Magic. They sell magic. They sell magic in a world in which there is no magic left. And they sell it to people who desperately need it. And we all buy into it, don't we? And don't tell me you don't. Where else would you invite a six-foot rat into your daughter's bedroom? <laughs> and it was at Disney. You see, everywhere else she went, because she didn't talk like anyone else or walk like anyone else. People stared at her. Little kids made fun of her. And some people would even cross the street 20 feet ahead of her so they didn't have to walk by this poor little girl in a cage. You know how it goes. But when she went to Disney, they didn't stare at her and they didn't make fun of her. They took one look at her and they lit up like a candle on a birthday cake and they came running because they knew what their job was. It was to sell magic to people who desperately need it. You and me, all of us, need to believe we live in a world where there's a little bit of magic. And they told her, Katie, today, you are a princess. That is your castle. This is your land. Here is a magic pass. You can go anywhere in the land you choose and you get to go first. And they said one more thing. They said, Katie, we want you to dream your dreams because no matter who you are and what you've been given, you can dream. And if you can dream it, you can do it. Second star on the right and until morning. And the little girl believed with all of her heart. She grew up believing with all of her heart. She never stopped. My birthday, my Christmas present to her last year was a princess lunchbox from the 1950s and she's 30 years old. The magic of Disney sustained and propelled her as she made her journey through life. And another thing happened. She discovered something very interesting because one day in school, as part of her IEP in the second grade, they gave her a little keyboard. It was called an alpha. And they said, Katie, if you can learn to type on this alpha, you can take your own notes and write your own papers. And she brought it home. She was all proud. She said, I can take it home. Yeah, you can take it home. And I said, gee, maybe we should have introduced you to that computer. Well, there, uh, there was a mistake because we couldn't get her off of it. She spent thousands of hours because, you see, there wasn't a lot of adaptive stuff in those days. It still isn't, unfortunately. Could be better. 
and trying to learn to type on this keyboard one finger, one letter at a time, like a horde of angry bees buzzing around, trying to hit a key and not being able to, taking 20 minutes to type one sentence. But she kept plugging away, hour after hour, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, she plugged away and she learned how to control to some degree those muscles that didn't want to be controlled, those nerves that didn't exist any longer. She fought and she worked and she got to where those buzzing angry bees became a symphony of movement that could do just about anything on the computer. It was hard work, but she applied herself once again with that ever-present smile every day. And she grew up, and she learned, and she started every year to get accolades. She got straight A's. Uh, as a matter of fact, when she, when she was uh, doing her freshman year in high school, we were meeting for the, her IEP for that year, at the beginning of the school year, and the counselor and the teachers were talking about Katie's education in high school and the, the help that she would need in her IEP. And as the counselor was wrapping up, she said, oh, by the way, Katie, uh, we, we got the physical education requirements for high school wait for you, of course, because you can't do that. So no phys ed, you don't have to earn the phys ed credits. And I could see the relief on her face. Oh, good. And at that moment, one of the other teachers, he looked like a coach, buzz cut, big burly arms. And sure enough, he spoke up. He said, Katie, you could earn that credit if you wanted to. And she said, how? He said, he, you could come out and be the manager of the girls' softball team. I'm the coach, and I think you'd make a great manager. And you'd earn a PE credit for doing it. Well, I could see right away that terrified her. She didn't know those girls. They were jocks. They knew how to run and throw and play. She'd never done anything like that. She'd never had sleepovers or parties at the mall. She didn't know if she could do it. And I could see the terror in her face. And then she turned and looked at me, and I knew what she was thinking. And I said, yeah, Katie, I'll help you any way I can. And then she turned back to that teacher, and that little chin of hers jutted out the way I would. And she looked at him, and she said, OK, I'll try. And it was at that moment that I learned that somewhere along the line she had learned that things are only worth it if you earn them. And she wanted to earn that PE credit. So she went to work for the girls softball team. Girls she didn't know and a job she didn't even think she could do. But she started learning how to do the work and haul out the equipment and support the girls and do the things that were required. And at the very first game, which they won, the other team came out to shake the Carson girls team's hands. Katie, of course, hung back in the dugout. And one of the girls from the team came over and said, come on, you've got to shake the other team's hand. She said, oh, no, I'm not on the team. I didn't play. And the girl looked at her and said, you're a member of this team, and you will come out and shake the other team's hand, and I will help you. Four years later, two varsity letters and twice the number of PE credits you need. She graduated from high school with the undying love of a bunch of jocks who could run and throw and play. And that also started a love affair with Barry Zito and the Oakland A's. And this last spring, my daughter and I completed our 13th annual trip to spring training in Phoenix, Arizona. We go every year. So yes. Oh, and by the way, the team went out to a tournament in her first year as manager in the summer, and I was on the road working, and she called me up. She said, Dad, when are you coming out? Because her brother, her brother was a star soccer player. Her brother brought trophies home, and he had walls full of trophies, and nah, 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 I got trophies, I got this, I got that. And he was always bragging about it. 
Well, she called me up. She said, Dad, when are you coming home? I said, in a couple days, Katie, why? She said, we went on a tournament and we won and I got a trophy. I said, really? She said, yes, and I want you to see it before I shove it down my brother's throat. And sure enough, I got home and there it was right up on the mantel in, in, in the, the place of honor, right next to that picture of Minnie Mouse saying happy birthday, Katie May. While she continued on with school, she always got A's. We knew there was something going on, something exceptional, because she always got A's. The problem was that I had to start saving money because I was going to need to pay it for psychiatric help if she ever got a B. She would tell me, Dad, I'm, it's going to happen this time. I'm going to get a B. I'm going to be, get a B. I know I am. I'm not, I'm not going to get an A. In this. I'm going to get a B. I'm going to get two Bs. Oh, she was frantic. I thought she was going to need counseling. And then the report card would come out, and I would look at it, and I would say, Katie, I am very unsatisfied with this report card. Where are my Bs? I don't see any Bs. They're all A's. Where are my Bs? Uh, of course, she couldn't write, so people had to write for her. I would write her math homework out. She would dictate it. I would write it. I thought I knew math. So I would say, are you sure that's right, Katie? I think this is wrong. And she would say, Dad, just write it the way I said it. <laughs> Her mother, on the other hand, did not know math. So she would write whatever Katie said. So I was no longer allowed to help her with her math homework. Her mother had to do that. I quit being able to help her with her homework in the eighth grade. She did everything up here. She couldn't write. She couldn't do manually except on the computer. So she did everything up here. She grew up learning kind of like Einstein did. Everything in her head. And it worked. Of course, she worked her butt off to do it. And she started winning awards. She started being noticed. She was invited to attend the People to People Ambassador Program, representing our country with young people in countries all over the world. And it is not a disability or special needs program. It is for the, quote unquote, normal people. But the school invited her. They wanted her to go. They wanted her to climb to the highest point of that bridge on Sydney Harbor and walk the Great Wall of China with the People to People ambassadors. And they told me, which I didn't tell Katie, that I had to buy a round trip ticket and have it in their possession so they could send her home at any time if she couldn't keep up because this was not a special needs program and she would have to haul her gear and keep up with the other girls or they were going to send her home. And I said, Katie, I don't think you should do this. I'm not going to let you go. I don't think it's right. I'm scared. I don't know that you might get hurt. I don't know. But I don't want you to do this. Well, that devastated her. And her mother, who would normally be the one to say no, was on the other side and we fought and we argued and one day I came home and my daughter the moment I came home grabbed me in the garage and she said dad I want to talk to you I said it's about the ambassador program isn't it she said yes I said okay I'm listening and she said and I'll never forget the words as they came out of her mouth she said dad I am not handicapped I said what Katie she said I am not handicapped she said, this is just who I am. And I realized at that moment, as the words rang out, this is just who I am, that she truly wasn't handicapped. She simply was who she was. As all of us are just who we are. No more, no less. We are who we are. And I said, okay, Katie, you can go. The hardest thing I ever did was watch her walk down that gangplank with the other girls in the runway, struggling to keep up with that big backpack on her as she went and represented our country and, yes, climbed to the highest point of that bridge in Sydney Harbor and walked the Great Wall of China with her group. She went on to finish high school with one award after another 
from her academic excellence and finally graduated high school at the top of her class and received several scholarships in engineering to go to a major state university, the University of Colorado, which she attended for one semester, and then the University of Nevada, Reno. And she continued on in college with the hard work and the computers and the help and the IEPs. And she fought to keep up and excel and do the things that she had been so good at. And it's funny because I remember she finally got a boyfriend, oh yeah, in college, after a sophomore year when the boys are, I guess, a little bit mature enough to look past the, uh, the issues. Uh, and I heard about this boyfriend from my wife, and I came home from the road, I work on the road a lot, and sure enough, I was at my office in Reno, and she called, and she said that it was the end of summer, and she was getting to go ready, ready to go back to college for her junior year, and she said, Dad, uh, are you in town? I said, yes, I just got in, Katie, from the airport. I'm in the office. She said, well, Brian and I want to come by and take you out to lunch, and uh, I want you to meet Brian. Brian was the boyfriend. And we went, oh, no, here it goes. Here it goes. I said, okay, that would be fine. You guys come on by, we'll go to lunch. So now my daughter is 20, 20, 20 21 years old, and I'm meeting her a boyfriend for the very first time in my life. I'm not used to this. Uh, so sure enough, seems like a nice, clean-cut kid. We go to a restaurant across the street from my office. I learn that he's from a nice family in town, good people, work hard, own a worldwide engineering firm. As a matter of fact, quite wealthy. You know the old adage, either work, work rich or marry rich, one of the two, right? There we go. I don't care about that sort of thing, but it just was an interesting fact. Um, he was smart. He was studying uh, computer engineering like my daughter. And very well-mannered, very polite. While I was in the bathroom cleaning up after dinner, after lunch, he picked up the check. Boyfriends are not supposed to pick up the check. Dads pick up the check, right guys? He picked up the check. Smooth move, kid. Smooth move. <laughs> then I said, Katie, we're getting ready for college. You know, we're getting ready for your junior year. I got to move you back into the dorm. She can't do that. She can't move stuff. And I hate moving. Raise your hand if you hate moving. And if you don't raise your hand, you're lying. And I hate moving. I said, now, you know I travel all the time. we got to schedule a day when I can move you back into the dorm. And she looked at me, and she said the words I thought I would never hear. She said, no, Dad, you don't have to move me this year. Brian's going to. I said, let me see if I got this straight. Good, clean-cut kid. Studying computer engineering, so he's not going to be a bum. He's going to have a job one day, right? Well-mannered, comes from a good, hard-working family who happens to be rich. You picked up lunch, and you're moving my daughter into the dorm? He said, uh, yeah. I said, you have my permission to marry her. <laughs> now, is that funny? I think that's funny. You guys think that's funny? I think that was funny. She didn't think that was funny. Her mother did not think that was funny. Boy, did I catch hell when I got home. What the hell are you thinking? I said, I thought it was the right thing to say at the time. It seemed funny to me. So they went on with their adventures in college. She studied computer engineering. She worked once again her butt off. And then one day, once again, I got the call. Dad, yes, you know I'm graduating, yes. Well, I got it. I said, you got what? Top scholar. The number one student in the entire Department of Engineering at the University of Nevada, Reno. 
not just tops, number one, the best of the bunch. And she still couldn't pick up a glass and drink out of it without a straw. But she beat them all. And I can't tell you how proud I was at what she had been able to accomplish in all that time. And while she was finishing up her degree, a dream that had been percolating in her mind for years, a dream that I wasn't aware of, had come to full blossom. You see, at Disney, they told her to follow her dreams because if you can dream it, you can do it. And they told her, second star on the right, and on till morning. Who's that? Anybody tell me? Peter Pan. And Katie decided that her dream was to work among those stars, to go to work with NASA. So she applied through a dis uh, disability entry program while she was in college for internships to NASA, and she was accepted. And she went down to the NASA, uh, to the, uh, NASA Ames Research Facility in the Bay Area in California where the very first summer she worked on software having to do with rocket engines. And if you ask me anything more than that, I'm going to get angry because I have no idea what it was she was talking about. Something to do with outliers and fuel and engine performance and all this stuff. I just called her. It, it was kind of a drag because one of my favorite lines had always been, that's all right, Katie, you'll figure it out. After all, it ain't rocket science. And I could no longer say that because guess what? It was rocket science. <laughs> and then they invited her back. They wanted her back at Ames, but no, she wanted to work on stuff going into space. So the next year she did her internship at the Goddard Space Flight Center in College Park, Maryland where she got to actually work on things going into space, like the James Webb Telescope, which was being run by her mentor. Yes, they invited her to attend while she was there, the prestigious NASA Academy for Future Leaders, where she was mentored by a Nobel Prize winning astrophysicist, the man, Dr. John Mathers, who proved beyond a shadow of a doubt the formation of our universe over 14 billion years ago, the Big Bang Theory. That was her, that was her mentor. That's him right there in the middle. In just the year before that picture was taken, Time magazine had listed him as one of the top 100 most influential people in the world. He was going to help change it. And he was working on a telescope called the James Webb Telescope, which they're still working on, that is supposed to be powerful enough when it is launched to look all the way back to the beginning of creation, the Big Bang Theory. And so Katie worked on image processing, with her mentor, Dr. Mather. She went on to study artificial intelligence and robotics. She got her master's. She published a paper that was accepted by a European robotics conference. We had to fly over to Bulgaria for her to present it. And I think it was probably the first time I truly understood just what was going on up in that mind because I was going to help her with the presentation she doesn't, she's hard to understand when she talks, and on a bad day, you can hardly understand her at all. So public speaking is really out of the question for her, but she had to get up and present her paper on artificial intelligence. So I was going to help her, and we went through it, and I said, okay, Katie, I can take you this far, and that's as far as I can go. The rest of it is Greek to me, and I'm not Greek. She said, okay, Dad. So she presented her paper. I've never been prouder. I was sitting in a room with all these brilliant people, and I decided to stay and watch some of the others because Katie was going to. And another fella got up, and he was presenting his paper, and he put up on the screen, have you guys seen Egyptian hieroglyphics? Do you know what math they do now that looks like Egyptian hieroglyphics? Well, he said... Here's my idea, here's the proof. And he put up a page of those Egyptian hieroglyphics. And I looked around the room and everybody in the room was reading the page like you and I read, see spot run, run spot run. They were reading it like it was English. And then I looked at my daughter and she was too. And I said, Katie, did you understand that? 
And she went, oh yeah, Dad, it was a good proof. It was a good proof. I said, I gotta get used to this rocket science thing. I don't know. So she came back, and then they invited her to join NASA's Intelligent Robotics Group back in Ames Research Center, asked her to join the team that was building the next generation free-floating anti-gravity robot that's going to go up to the space station later this year. There it is right there. It's called the Astro B. And the Astro B will float in, gravita in, in no gravity. It will move in, th in three dimensions. It can dock itself. It will actually help the astronauts. It has an arm. It can reach out and grab your glasses if you're not careful. It has fans and compressed air so it can move around in a no-gravity environment. And it runs on three different operating systems, including uh, 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 Linux, Linux. And who's got an Android? Yes, there is an app for that. It will run Android. And they will be able to send up experiments uh, and Android apps to run on the Astro B. They have mocked up uh, a laboratory, anti-gravity laboratory, at the Ames Research Center to develop this robot. And there it is with Katie and some of her team right there with the Astro B behind. And there she is. She is working with the team that is building that robot and sending it up to space. And uh, thank you. I asked her when, uh, when, they, when she transferred out there from Goddard on the East Coast, and I said, well, you're, you're working on the robot now. She said, yeah. I said, what did they put you on? What are you working on? And, she, and at first I asked, are there any other women on your team? She said, no, Dad, I'm the only woman on the team. I said, really? What's that like? She said, well, since I'm smarter than most of them, it's okay. <laughs> Cocky little thing, isn't she? And then, uh, then I said, well, what have they got you working on? And she said, well, Dad, they put me in charge of the robot's fault system. I said, let me see if I got this right. They got one woman on the team, and they put her in charge of finding faults? <laughs> They're smarter than I thought they were. She didn't like that too much. But that's where she's at now. They're getting ready to launch and send this robot up to the space station. And the only thing her mother keeps saying day after day is, don't send her up there with it. Don't send her up there with it. Because yes, she would love to be one of the first challenged people to go into space. But there she is, my rocket scientist, my hero. Um, she's going to help change the world. And all because she got the opportunity, the opportunities to not be held back by people who thought, you can't do this, you can't do that, you're not normal, you have to go sit in the corner over there. It was a long journey and a lot of learning. And I know there are people in this room, oh, and by the way, that uh, young man, who I gave permission to marry my daughter. Well, nine years later, he finally took me up on it. And there she is. I got to walk her down the aisle last December. Carly was there. And uh, it's kind of hard to believe the long, long journey we went through. I will say this, we did not raise our daughter so much as she raised us. And I know, I know there are a lot of people in this room who are just beginning or in the middle of their journey. I thought you might find it valuable to hear from someone who's gone the whole ride. I'm not suggesting that every or anybody can become a rocket scientist. I am suggesting it's not the end of the journey that's worthwhile. It's taking the journey itself. And what were some of the things that our daughter taught us? 
in this long journey. What are some of the things that I hope you're learning or understanding? Well, I think the very first thing she taught us, the very first thing we learned is one day at a time. You have been given a gift, and that is this. You have been given the gift of living in the present. Because most people in the world live in the future or the past. They think about what they're going to do tomorrow, or they think about what they did yesterday. But they rarely think about what? What they're doing right now, today. And if there is one thing our daughter taught us, we were given a gift to live one day at a time and see it as an opportunity to explore this gift we were given. And that was one of the most important things we learned. One day at a time, as you go on your journey, I know inside many of you is that big hole, that unknown. What will happen? What will happen to me? What will happen to my loved one? What will happen? What is the future like? What is in store for me? Only time will tell. So the gift you've been given is to focus on one day at a time. Don't look beyond that because the riches of your life, no matter who you are, are contained in this moment, this day, right now. What else did she teach us? Push, but don't shove. Not everybody can be a rocket scientist. I know I can't. But we were told if she can do something, if you see an aptitude, if you see a potential, push it. Don't shove it. Just push. Gently, steadily, with loving pressure, push. Push. Life is a risk. All of us must take risks must put ourselves out there a little bit. No matter who we are, we have to push. It's the way we were built, every one of us. Push it a little bit. Get a little outside your comfort zone. Don't be afraid to push yourself and to push those you love. Don't be afraid. But don't shove them. Don't shove them. Just push. Everyone needs a champion. I have two people in this room. I have the challenged and I have the champions. And they are both heroes in my book. Katie was the challenged and we were the champions. I, I, I'd like to take credit for that. I can't. It was her mother. Fighting for her in the IEPs, fighting at school, fighting every turn, fighting for every advantage, fighting for everything, never taking no, being realistic. When uh, the public school system was hesitant about taking her and we said, we don't believe in dragging down an entire class of people for one person. That's not right. If she can't keep up, fine. But you will let her try. Well, she's going to need an aid. And her mother said, I'm there. Every day, I will go. And I will be that aid. And I will volunteer at that school. She had her champion. All of us need a champion. All of us need someone in our corner. All of us need someone to fight for us. You need a champion. That was what she taught us. Number four, resources are critical. That is why I'm so amazed. 20 years. I don't think Lori wanted this to go 20 years. I think she wanted it to solve a problem and go away. But it's a problem that's never going to be solved. There's always going to be a need for resources, and you the challenged and the champions need to continue to fight to find and utilize those resources. 150 years ago, my daughter would have been put in an institution. And today, she's going to help change the world. The resources are there. Find them. And when they're not there, create your own, like Lori did. I wish I'd had this. 30 years ago. Oh, I wish I'd had this 30 years ago. But you do now. It's an incredible group. And it's not just awareness, but also finding and matching resources to whatever our needs are. And I speak to both the challenged and the champion. 
We both need resources. And finally, last and most important, the most important lesson my daughter taught me, the most important theme of the book you've been given to read, it goes throughout it. And the only thing I really have to tell you in the world today, what I've learned more than anything else, is simply this. There is no normal. There is only what you've been given and what you choose to do with it. That is it. There is no black and there is no white. There is no tall and there is no short. There is no average weight and average height and average body. There is no normal range of anything. There is only you and me and what we've been given and what we choose to do with it. And when the world can truly approach life that way, then we will truly be free to do the one thing we were meant to do from the day we were born, and that is to love and be loved by others. That is the only thing that is normal, to love and be loved. So I bring you that one last little bit of wisdom, if you want to call it that, I guess. I lost my little clicker here. It's flashing at me. There we go. There is no normal. There's, uh, Richard, you want to hit the button on that computer once? There we go. There's only what you're given and what you choose to do with it. My uh, sister gave birth to a little baby girl. Her name was Hallie. This was back in 1982. Hallie lived for one year. She was born with a bad heart. And for one year, they tried to save her. They tried to make her whole. They they failed. But if there's one thing I knew for and learned from that, it was this, simply this. Hallie had a great life. Oh, she only lived for one year. But for that year, she loved and she was loved. And there's nothing more you can ask for in life than that right there. That's all you can ask for. So I think of my niece often. Katie thinks of her niece, the niece she never met, often. We keep her alive in our memories. But no matter who you are or what challenges you face in this life, and we all face them. Some face them physically in wheelchairs. Some face them mentally with autism and such. Some face them because we just face them. That's life. But at the end of the day, we are all the same. We want to love and we want to be loved. Now, as uh, Jim mentioned, I'm in the gambling business and have been for many, many years, 40 years, teaching people how to sell to people who are looking for fun, looking for risk, looking for fun in our casinos and our resorts. I kind of took after P.T. Barnum, who uh, once said, well, the most noble thing you could do is to entertain others and make them feel good. I truly believe in that, and I try to teach people the good in that and how to make other people feel good. Gambling's kind of a funny way to do it, but I do. So I thought I would end with a little gambling statement, one of my favorites, and one that I think guided me with Katie more than anything else, and I hope you find it valuable, and it simply goes like this. Hmm, you want to hit that key again? You don't have a right to the cards you believe you should have been dealt. You have an obligation to play the hell out of the ones you're holding. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Good luck with the conference. Get the most you can out of it. Remember, go out, love, and be loved. I'm going to turn it back over to Jim. He's got a couple of things he wants to say.